We are here at Villa Wannsee, just outside of Berlin, in a picturesque place just beside Lake Wannsee. Yet it was the place where, led by Reinhard Heydrich, 15 leading Nazi bureaucrats were gathering to plan the final solution, the murder of 11 million Jews that were living in Europe at that time. This poses the question, what led them to a point that 15 highly educated people, half of them had a PhD degree, some were sons of pastors, theologians, came to a point to plan the murder of 11 million Jews in Europe. In order to understand that, let's take a step back in German history. In 1933, with a population of 60 million, almost all Germans belonged to either the Roman Catholic or the Protestant churches. The Jewish community in Germany was less than 1% of the total population. The anti-Jewish Nazi ideology strongly enforced the anti-Semitism that was historically widespread throughout Europe and had deep roots in Christian history. The largest Protestant church in Germany in the 1930s was the German Lutheran Church, with a theologically grounded tradition of loyalty to the state. A movement emerged within this denomination called the German Christians. The German Christians embraced the nationalistic and racial aspects of Nazi ideology. Once the Nazis came to power, this group supported a Nazified version of Christianity and were zealous supporters of Adolf Hitler. One of the reasons why the Christian church in Germany would not stand up in full force against Adolf Hitler was the long-standing history of Christian anti-Semitism that is dating back even to the first centuries of the church. It had its climax in the 3rd century and 4th century, leading to the Council of Nicaea, where the Jewish people were being denounced as the enemy of the church. They were depicted as Christ killers and even as enemies of God. But this Christian anti-Semitism even had a very interesting German facet. The most important Christian that ever lived here in Germany was Martin Luther. He wrote a special book that was directed against the Jewish people, and he said something like the following. In section 11, Martin Luther advises Protestants to carry out the following actions, to burn down Jewish synagogues and schools, to refuse to let Jews own houses among Christians, to take away Jewish religious writings, to forbid rabbis from teaching, to offer no protection to Jews on highways, for all the Jews silver and gold to be removed, to give young strong Jews flail, axe, spade and spindle and let them earn their bread in the sweat of their brow. So when Adolf Hitler started to prosecute the Jewish people in Germany and some Christians started to challenge him about it, he very easily could quote Martin Luther and he said, what do you want? I'm just fulfilling what our German church father, Martin Luther, Luther is commanding us to do. And therefore, it doesn't surprise us that many people which participated here at the Wednesday conference, they were even trained theologians. Some of them have been the sons of pastors. They were all of them raised up with the Christian heritage. Each one of them had been a member of a Christian church, but there was no inner voice which convicted them to do otherwise. This means for us today that as anti-Semitism is on the rise again, and as Jews even here in Germany, out of all places, are afraid to wear a kippah again, that we as church need to stand up in solidarity and in friendship with the Jewish people, but also with the state of Israel. We should never forget that Jesus, our Savior, was Jewish. We should never forget that our Bible is a Jewish book. And we might wonder, how could the church forget that? But today we are called, with the state of Israel being in existence, to be in friendship and solidarity connected with the Jewish people in their homeland. Abraham received this incredible promise from God, where God says, if you bless my seed, I will bless you also. And let's be a people of blessing that is blessing his people, learn from the past, but change the future in our days today.